Good evening, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. Welcome, welcome in. I do have uh, comments on sub only so that we don't have to uh, fight with the trolls tonight. So welcome in. You can feel free to just come and hang out with us, even with the uh, chat turned to uh, sub only. So uh, again, I'm trying to just make it so we can uh, go through information without being uh, attacked. <laughs> That's my hope. Good evening, Kaya. Hello, Grammy. Good to see you all. Welcome, welcome. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, James. Welcome. Good to see you. I hope everyone's been having a good weekend so far. So far, so good, hopefully. Hello, hello. Oh, Nikki. Hello, welcome. Welcome in. I'm trying to figure out which pen I want to use tonight. Should we use a peacock tonight, everybody? Let's go. Let's do peacocks tonight. <laughs> There we go. Yay. That's for fun. <laughs> well, welcome in, uh, Siberio. Siberio. <laughs> Sorry, I'm saying your name wrong, but welcome. <laughs> I do have us again on uh, sub chat only tonight in order to kind of stay clear as best as we can of the trolls so that everybody can uh, kind of focus on what we're talking about as opposed to uh, chasing down uh, the trolls. Because <laughs> there's a lot of that going on. Oh, thanks, Dolphin. I appreciate that. Can't usually say too much of this document. I'm watching for my... Oh, absolutely, Amy. Absolutely. I myself can't either. That's why I have to take things uh, in bite-sized pieces. So I'm still, you know, we're only a little bit through the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Department of Vets Affairs. You know, we will probably make it through because it's a short chapter, but I'm with you. It's got to be bite-sized. Thanks for covering. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. It's, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And uh, fun is there. <laughs> Any fun left? All right. Well, hmm, maybe fun's a strong word. <laughs> and Navy vet, I'm going to need some uh, assistance too. This is not an area that I specialize in, everybody. Uh, although both of my parents are vets uh, and do uh, use the uh, veterans benefits. So it's, and my brother and my uncle. And my other uncle, wait, hold on, <laughs> my whole family, oh my gosh. So yes, but I still don't, uh, I still don't know <laughs> that much about it. Yes, yes, oh, understandable, Amy, understandable. And again, I am putting um, my lives up. I have them in a queue. It's, I kind of wait a couple of days in between posts so that the algorithm doesn't get completely uh, bogged down so they're kind of they're not very happy if you post too much over there so oh yeah 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 so welcome nancy we're gonna go through the uh, department of veterans affairs tonight 10 years oh great i'm gonna need some help then <laughs> help me with information <laughs> i really don't know a lot about the details of uh the va but uh so i'm hoping everyone can kind of chime in and help out a little bit as we go through this. So uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, of course, is one of the administrative agencies in the executive branch. And uh, just to remind everybody of what we're doing here, we're going through uh, Project uh, or P25, which is what I'm calling it now so that the algorithm doesn't ding me on it. Uh, we have Mandate for Leadership, the Conservative Promise. This is available online, free for anyone. Um, you know, I don't, I printed it out because that's what I do here. I print stuff out. <laughs> but if you uh, go online, you can take a look at it. And the structure here, absolutely, VC. Please remember, yes, it will be. Exactly. Come and go as you need to, everyone. It is overwhelming. Uh, it really is. It will not hurt my feelings if you need to kind of uh, come and go as we go through it. But the first section is taking the reins of government. And the second is the common defense. So these are the departments involving defense. And then uh, we've got section three, the general welfare. And then the economies in section four. Section five is independent regulatory agencies. And this is where we're going to find the FEC, so the uh, regulation uh, of that. But what we want, and again, the economies before that, what we're going to today is section three, the general welfare. And at the very bottom, Chapter 20, this is the Department of Veterans Affairs. So we're starting on page 641 
Uh, and that's that's where we're at tonight. Um, I have gone through a little bit of the um, uh, a little bit of Homeland Security, but of course we do need to take a lot of breaks. <laughs> so I'm taking a break and going through this one tonight. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. It, it really is a lot easier. From what I understand, they want to make it more difficult to get a rating. So it seems like they're... All right. So who who remembers, if anybody here, uh, who, who remembers during Trump's first administration uh, how things went? Does anyone remember a little bit about uh, how the uh, Veterans Affairs situation went there were a couple of really big uh, pieces of legislation that went through. And, okay, no, <laughs> fair enough. I don't know that I remember either. Uh, there were a couple of really big pieces. And hello, John. Hello. Good to see you. And uh, so some of those big pieces, uh, Biden has put kind of a, a block in front of to make them a little bit uh more difficult, but it's looking like, as I've gone through this, that they're going to try to reinstate everything that he had done in his first uh, term. So, and then of course we have the overall, um, we have the overall piece here. They're passing protection of the PACT Act this week. Really, that's interesting. So uh, of course here they're talking about um, you know, healthcare, how they want to switch that around and those kinds of things. So I'll walk you through it. Uh, but it, again, it's primarily refocusing back on what he had tried to do his first term with a lot of negativity about <laughs> how his first term, uh, you know, Biden got in and like changed everything, which he really didn't. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. Right, right. So, you know, this again, a lot of what goes through the uh, Veterans Affairs has to be approved through Congress. And that's probably if you were trying to look for the weak spots in P25, the number one weakest spot behind P25. And I don't care who you are and what cabinet position you have, but is that they have all of these goals and dreams and wishes but about 85% of it's going to have to go through Congress. So these are, they set out basically co goals that they have to get Congress to agree with them and pass the legislation that they need in order to have something happen. So keep that in mind. Again, we've got about 85% of this is, has to be done with Congress, not just the president. We do have executive orders, of course. We do have the cabinet. We do have administrative agencies. So at the top, we have a lot of political positions, which we would have had no matter who got into office. And those can be switched and moved around a little bit. A little bit. But the actual um, pieces here that they're really trying to overcome, those have to go through Congress. So the suggestion in P25 is, of course, to go to Congress and tell them to do this. And <laughs> Congress will listen or maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, Amanda. <laughs> I agree. Now, I'm not trying. I'm not going to say P25 doesn't have any teeth or that it's not harmful because that's not true. I don't believe that's true at all. I think it is quite harmful. But on the other side of it, it's not that, you know, all 1,000 pages will take effect in those first 100 days. So I'm just kind of putting that out there for everyone. There is a procedure that has to be followed uh, just based off of how our branches of government work. So keep that in mind as we go through here. Uh, Rylan, oh, sure. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, like I said, it's not great. It's not good stuff, everybody. It's pretty, uh, pretty, you know, rubbish. <laughs> and, we, and we tried to tell everybody, but, you know, no one listens to us. So <laughs> anyway, so tonight I will take you through, again, this is a shorter chapter. I want to make sure... Um, that I have this up high enough so that the comments uh, can be seen okay. So if I ever uh, get the document too far uh, down so you can't see comments, just let me know, everybody, all right? Uh, so hopefully Congress has our backs. I'm not sure uh, exactly, but what I do know is that there is no um, really strong majority that's kind of uh, browbeating everybody. And that is unusual. That's kind of unusual. We've only got a few seats of a majority in the Senate and in the House, and that actually may be switched. So we, uh, you know, with that infighting, so to speak, uh, there's going to be some pretty big problems. 
Can you see the cozy flannel, <laughs> Thomas? Yes, my cozy flannel, everybody. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> I have to. The weather's getting colder, so <laughs> got to get the flannels out. And uh, <laughs> this one's super cozy. I thought, oh, well, maybe I should put a you know different top on. Then I'm like, nah, forget it. <laughs> forget about it. So we'll be all right. You should P25. It looks great on the service, but when you see the effects, it looks very bad. Agreed. I agree. I agree. You're too optimistic. Congress will do something strange for some change. And that, you know, I think is a factor. I, I can't disagree with that. I think Congress uh, could very well and has in the past uh, passed legislation that's completely rubbish. And uh, yeah, I think that's definitely there. But I don't think, you know, it's going the whole of P25 is going to be just put in and approved and signed because it's just not wouldn't it's not going to work that way even if you look at the republicans there are a lot of republicans that do not like quite a bit of what's in here so we'll just keep thinking about that uh as we go through but i'm not i wouldn't say and i you know i'm glad you brought that term up optimistic because you know i'm i'm not necessarily optimistic I'm just not surprised. I guess I've seen so many and looked into so many Congresses over the, the centuries that it's like, well, you know, they, they do what they do, but uh, I'm not shocked here. Although again, once it's, it's very interesting how close it is. Once Congress decides what recourse is their lawsuits. Well, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way to put it. Uh, but again, nobody's got two thirds. No one's got a super majority by any means. They barely have a simple majority uh, and they've got a lot of people flipping back and forth. So we don't really know what's going to actually happen in Congress. I think at this point, we it's going to be a coin toss on how many people. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of uh, movers and shakers, meaning I think the Dems and the Republicans are going to or some Republicans are going to finally have to negotiate with each other and say, look, you know, I'll support you on one, two, three, if you give me support on four, five, and six. So there's, they're going to have to work together because the numbers are so tight. Cautiously optimistic is the term. Oh, thank you very much, Navy Vet. Exactly right. Exactly right. And again, I'm not sure optimistic, but maybe I'm just, um, yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, let's use that. Let's use that. Cautiously optimistic. And I think one of the terms that came out was nauseously optimistic at one point. And that may be, <laughs> that may be the new one. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. So uh, any of my veterans out there that are hanging out um, with me, make sure I, I will be uh, asking for insight as we go through this and feel free to just make your comments uh, as you as we go through this and let me know how you're feeling if you want to if you're comfortable doing that excellent john excellent uh, again and then if anyone's listening that's not a subscriber just write your question down and put it on any of my other posts and i will come back and answer that again my sub chat is on tonight due to the sheer quantity of the troll situation <laughs> Uh, yeah, the negotiating. I agree. I agree. I think we finally have backed everybody into a corner so much that there has to be some kind of uh, collaborations going on or nothing will get done. And maybe they just don't want to get anything done. I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised at that either. So here we go, everybody. Again, uh, let me. Would a sticky note be helpful or does everyone when they see this, they know what it is? Should I do a sticky note? I hear Deborah in my head say, yes, do a sticky note. <laughs> so I'm just wondering. <laughs> Gonna have your dad watch once you put, okay, excellent, 22 years. Oh my gosh, that's fabulous. Yes, okay. <laughs> All right, let me make my sticky note here, everybody, so we can have it. Yes, please, yes, yes. All right, so um, this is going to be Pete. You know, I've seen a lot of people actually starting to talk about this again, which I think is great. You know, the more you know. Uh, so, and then we're going to be going through the Department of uh, Veterans Affairs. And again, uh, almost all of my family are vets uh, from multiple different uh, wars and such. Thank you, John. Uh, but unfortunately, I just really have never looked into uh, the benefits much. So I'm going to have to kind of, well... Yeah, so I'm going to need some help, everyone. <laughs> I'll just put that out there as we get started here. 
Yes, and you know, I'll be posting this myself up on YouTube and letting my mom know. She, she, my mother's a vet and she's very interested in what's going to happen and is worried about it. So, you know, I've, I've got some skin in the game here too uh, myself. So uh, we will help. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so let's go ahead and dive in everybody. Um, although if you don't mind, before we dive in, can I get a quick heads up if you're comfortable? Can you tell me which branch? Uh, you were in. I'm just wondering if we've got uh, which branches we have. Uh, my family's army. Uh, that's just how it is. <laughs> so I'm wondering who all we have. I think we might have a navy one in here. <laughs> but army, marine, navy. All right. Wonderful. USMC. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Mama. <laughs> navy, army, U.S. Navy. Okay. Not retired, but four years. Oh my gosh, John. Okay. Thank you. Army and Air Force, son of Marines. Okay, wow, we've got the whole, we've got whole, every, I think there might have been a Navy in there, right? Navy that, <laughs> true, true, true. So, okay, wonderful, wonderful. We've got a really broad uh, broad group and I, I love that. Yeah, great variety, thank you, VC. Um, I love that, that's uh, fantastic. So, well, let's go ahead and dive in, everybody. We, of course, start each chapter here with introduction pieces. So what the mission statement is, and then an overview of what they'd like to do. And then they'll kind of go line by line on what they want to change. This particular chapter, in my opinion, is actually very well organized. I thought this Tucker person did a pretty good job uh, actually organizing it. Now, whether or not I agree with it, that's different. So Air Force, oh my gosh. Army Halloween costume, oh my goodness, I love that. Except the Coast Guard, really? Okay, Space Force, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've met anyone from Space Force. Air Force, okay, oh, I love it, I love it, I love it. 82nd Airborne, oh my gosh. Okay, USMC, okay, that's, that's amazing, everybody, amazing. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. Here's our mission statement. The Department of Veterans Affairs, or the VA, is a primary provider of healthcare, benefits and memorial affairs for America's veterans and their families. The VA has the noble responsibility to render exceptional and timely support and services with respect, compassion, and competence. Now, I'm going to just say this right here. I think the first two sentences are okay <laughs> so far. The veteran is at the forefront of every VA process and interaction. The VA must continually strive to be recognized as a, quote, best in class or, quote, veterans centric system with an organizational ethos inspired by and accountable to the needs and problems of veterans, not subservient to the parochial <laughs> preferences of a bureaucracy. So that's, again, our mission statement, very similar to uh, what Mr. Trump had done in his first term uh, with his mission statement as well. And we'll see how that ties together. So all branches, all wars, really, since the Civil War, my goodness. Well, that's a, well, goodness gracious. Here's our overview. At the end of the Obama administration, the VA was held in low esteem, both by the veterans it served and by the employees who served these former warriors. Eroding morale caused the downstream effect of a healthcare access crisis in 2014, led to the resignation of Secretary Eric uh, Shinseki, Shinseki and extensive oversight investigations by Congress from 2015 to 2016. So this is my first question, everybody. Are, do you think that that's accurate? Is this an accurate description of where the VA uh, landed before Trump came into office? I'm just curious, again, because I don't have a lot of history. It was, <laughs> maybe that it was a mouthful. But do we feel that way? I mean, I I felt like it. the VA kept getting worse and worse and worse uh, as time went on, but I, I'm not sure if if people agree. No, okay, no, it's not that, not that bad. No, no, okay, okay, good, good. Uh, again, I'm just curious uh, at this point. Massive drawdown caused claims to increase. Okay, yeah, that was one of my... Uh, pieces as well. I was wondering about that. Okay, well, interesting, interesting. Next up, we've got 
Uh, by 2020, however, the VA had become one of the most respected U.S. agencies. This significant progress was due in part to the leadership of Secretary Robert Wilkie from 2018 to 2021 and his team of political appointees and career senior executives, many of them veterans, who led the effort to ensure that the VA became veteran-centric in its governance decisions and fostered a more positive work environment. So we're going to see this over and over again, this idea of veteran-centric, so this kind of idea uh, that they're putting out here. So everything that they're doing is to try to be veteran. Uh, efficiency of claims. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, this mindset translated into a department that was better attuned to employees' and veterans' needs and experiences in the daily operations of healthcare benefits. And um, I'm at the very top here, but I think I've got a good spot for comments, so I'm not going to bump it down too much. Uh, and memorial affairs. During that period, the VA received the largest number of watershed congressional authorizations to reform its health care and benefits that it had received since post-Vietnam War years, along with historic increase in annual appropriations, which have tripled since the last full year of the George W. Bush administration. That's a stretch. It did not grow much and still has yet to change. All right. Yep, yep. They make it impossible to hire veterans, to care for veterans. Because the hiring freeze, oh my gosh, upgrade. You know what? I think you have absolutely hit the bullseye on what the issue is with a lot of what they are proposing here. Uh, the current VA leadership team of Biden appointees has adopted some of their predecessors' as governance processes. However, they've not sustained the previous administration's commitment to a genuine veteran-centric philosophy, most notable with respect to the delivery of health care, and harbor a bias towards expanding the unionized federal employee workforce that has not always been aligned with a focus on veteran-centric care. So a lot, again, of what they'll be saying here is going to be taking jabs at the Biden administration. There also is growing concern in Congress and the veteran community that the VA is poorly managing and in some cases disregarding provisions of the VA mission, maintaining internal systems and strengthening Inter Integrated Outside Networks Act of 2018. So this was the big uh, act that was passed under Trump here. It's one of the people who, oh no, oh my gosh. Oh, my gosh. My goodness gracious. Oh, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. So, yes, we're going to talk a lot here about the uh, act that was passed here. Uh, efforts to expand disability benefits to large populations without adequate planning have caused an erosion of veterans' trust in the VA enterprise. And I think that's, you know, all right. Additionally, the current VA leadership is focusing very publicly on social equity and inclusion within department policy discussions towards ends that will affect only a small minority of the veterans who use the VA. For the first time, the VA is allowing access to abortion services, a medical procedure unrelated to military service, that the VA lacks the legal authority and clinical proficiency to perform, in addition to continuing the grotesque cultural, grotesque culture of violence against the child in the womb, these socio-political initiatives and ideological indoctrinizations distract from the department's core missions. So I think they're pretty clear about that. <laughs> Where they stand? Oh my gosh! Where they stand here on uh, the abortion issue? That isn't true, is it? Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, again, it's been, if you look at the uh, military leadership, you know, if if it's a healthcare situation and they're a vet, then, you know, they take care of business. And so they're saying here that even if there aren't medical problems uh, with, you know, um, with the uh, child or carrying the pregnancy, then they don't have it. That's inaccurate. They were performing AB because of the medical. Exactly. Yeah, it's a medical situation. It's not just, which I think overall people just do not understand about this abortion issue is it's medical procedures here. We're not just running around and, you know, doing stuff. So this kind of gets <laughs> this uh, 
philosophy, of course, is uh, very difficult to stomach here. Even in cases of, yes, exactly, exactly. Who's the author? So let me flip back real quick. It is Brooks D. Tucker. I'm not sure, man or woman, I don't know. Maybe Miss, Miss Tucker, Brooks, or Mr. Tucker, Mr. or Miss, I'm, I'm not sure who it is. Um, I guess this, we'll just refer to them as a they. There we go. They, <laughs> Tucker. <laughs> Provides that. Oh, exactly. Exactly right. Exactly right. This isn't new. It's healthcare. It's nothing new. Departmental history here. Uh, following the Civil War, state veterans' homes were established to provide medical and hospital treatment for all injuries and diseases. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, quote, Congress established a new system of veterans' benefits, including programs for disability compensation, insurance for service personnel and veterans, and vocational rehabilitation for the disabled, end quote. That was overseen by three different federal programs, the Veterans Bureau, the Department of Interior's Bureau of Pensions, and the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers. In 1921, Congress combined those programs into the Veterans Bureau, following World War II, a national VA hospital system, much of which remains operational today, was established to care for millions of returning veterans. Following the Vietnam War, the VA's federally owned and operated hospital network expanded again to meet the needs of the volunteer and draftee population. In the past two decades, the VA has purposefully transitioned to leasing medical properties rather than building expensive new facilities that can take years to complete and often experience budget overruns. As the nature of healthcare has evolved with the growth of same-day surgical procedures and outpatient care, so has the VA. And in 2018, Congress added access to private sector urgent care outlets as one of the VA's health care benefits. So this was huge. This is my understanding. This private sector possibility was really huge, where if you've got uh, something going on rather than... Um, you know, like if you broke your arm and your closest VA facility was two hours away, you know, it's that's a long two hours with a broken arm. So what they're saying here is that they added this piece in where you could go to a local. Yes, exactly. You could go to a local place as well. Formerly an investment advisor for Deutsche Bank. Really? That's interesting. Oh, it's a he. Okay. I mean, okay, fair enough. Author was form. Right, right. That's very interesting. Yes. So... The T's, yes, yes, he was part of the last administration. Yikes, I'm not surprised. So again, this private sector uh, possibility is very important, although there are some problems with it, but still, uh, actually, let me ask the chat, what do you all think about the uh, private sector option that was uh, put into place? Are we, are we good with that? Are we glad that happens? Thank you, upgrade. Yes, the Obama passed it, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. American Care Act, or is the VA stuff separate from the uh, ACA? Well, my understanding is that it's separate because of how they wrote uh, the the law itself. But I could be wrong. It helped things a lot. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm one. I was wondering about that. It seems like it was really needed, but it doesn't work. Oh my gosh, Miss Julie, I think that's exactly again the bullseye of the problem here. Healthcare billing perspective, VA patients. It was huge. Okay. It helps with ERs. It's a good option if you have no facility nearby. Excellent. It works. Bypasses insurance. VA pays only half. So, right. And I think that's another problem, too, is how much the VA will pay uh, when you go into the private sector. So, I think that's definitely an issue. It really depends on where you are and how it's implemented. Okay, excellent. Today, the VA operates 172 inpatient VA medical centers. Uh, which are an average of 60 years old, and 1,113 community-based outpatient clinics, which are newer facilities designed to meet the needs of veterans closer to home. The VA also manages a community care network, or CCN, through contracts with Optum and TriWest, third-party health care administrators, responsible for building and maintaining a robust population of community providers to meet the needs 
of veterans referred for care outside of the VA system. Currently, approximately 6.4 million veterans out of 18 million nationally and out of the 9.1 million who are enrolled use the VA for health care. The remainder use employer-sponsored plans, TRICARE, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, your VA is more than 100 years old. Oh, my gosh. Interesting. Very interesting. The disability benefits system evolved a significant evolved significantly in the years between the Cold War era and the global war on terrorism, a period when the VA enrolled large numbers of veterans from World War II, Korea and Viet uh, and Vietnam who were seeking disability benefits and health care. Disability compensation is the largest VA benefit, but there are also dozens of others, the next largest of which is the GI Bill and the Home Loan Guarantee. These benefits are administered through the 56 regional benefits offices and hundreds of satellite sites around the country. The Agent Orange Act of 1991 significantly expanded the scope of disability benefits for those who had deployed to Vietnam and the cost of those benefits began to increase dramatically as the Vietnam generation of veterans aged and began experiencing adverse health conditions, some of which were presumed to have been caused by uh, defoliant chemicals used in Southeast Asia. In 2016 and 2017, a burdensome backlog of appeals of denied disability claims from multiple wartime generations. And uh, let's see, a backlog numbering in the hundreds of thousands led to the joint effort by the VA Veterans Service Organizations and Congress to pass legislation that streamlined the appeal process. Implemented in 2017, this historic good governance success has helped the VA to reduce the number of these appeals dramatically. The New Orleans VA is brand new. Well, that's interesting. You know, I, I think, again, if they're saying, well, they're 60 years old, I'm not, I'm not sure. Is that like good or not? <laughs> I'm not sure why that is uh, an essential piece. Have used all the benefits, the GI Bill? Really? Okay. All right. Excellent. The Sergeant First Class Health Robinson honoring our promise to address comprehensive toxic toxics, the PACT Act. Right. Here we go. Thank you very much, uh, Navy vet. Uh, here we go. Addressed adverse health outcomes presumed to be the result of veterans exposure to airborne toxins during the global war on terrorism and further expanded disability benefits to the most recent generation of veterans. These ambitious authorities, like the 1991 authorities, have the potential to overwhelm the VA's ability to process new disability claims and adjudicate appeals. Currently, the VA is seeking to hire large numbers of personnel to process these claims while exploring the use of an automated process to accelerate claims, reviews, and decisions. The ever-present lag in the hiring and training of new employees could result in major problems with the timely adjudication of benefits well into the next administration in 2025. And that could have a slowdown when you're trying to hire a bunch of people, but uh, you're trying to hire a bunch of people so that things can like go smoothly, right? Oh, these people. Oh, I know. Oh, VC. Oh, my gosh. The presumed. I know. <laughs> Knocked me out of my chair for a little bit. I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> In sum, the VA, for the foreseeable future, will experience significant fiscal human capital and infrastructure crosswinds and risks. So you'll see that this uh, financial piece of it is really coming through quite a bit. Budgets are at a historic high with and with a workforce now above 400,000, the VA is contending uh, with a lack of new veteran enrollees to offset the declining population of older veterans. Recruitment of medical and benefits personnel has become more challenging. Veterans are migrating from the northern states to the southern and western states for retirement and employment. Meanwhile, VA information technology is struggling to keep pace with the evolution of patient care and re record keeping. Consequently, VA leaders in the next administration must be wise and courageous uh, with political strategies, experienced managers to run day-to-day -day operations more effectively, innovators to address the changing veteran 
landscape and agile fixers to mitigate and repair systemic problems created or ignored by the present leadership team. So this looks like a boilerplate language to me. And that just means that it's something that's kind of stamped in every part of P25 here. Won't buy them new equipment. Yeah. Oh, I know. Human capital. Oh my gosh. I know. And it doesn't get much better. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty offensive. And also this, uh, the aging generations too is a very, uh, in my opinion, very rudely discussed, but here we go. Moving on to the next piece. Let me grab my tea for a minute. They left politics out of healthcare. It wouldn't be a problem. I agree. I agree. So, man, they see 18 patients a day. I can't even imagine how, how much work that would be. Oh, my gosh. All right. Veterans Health Administration. So, the VHA. So, there's multiple different departments here, and they're going to set out what they want as reforms. Again, most of this has to be done through Congress. Needed reforms. Rescind all departmental clinical policy directives that are contrary to the principles of conservative governance, starting with abortion services and gender reassignment surgery. Neither aligns with the service-connected conditions that would warrant VAs providing this type of clinical care, and both follow the left's pernicious trend of abusing the role of government to further its own agenda. That's the whole paragraph's a lie. Yeah! <laughs> goodness oh my goodness yeah waiting for appointments two to three hours oh my gosh yeah so again they're going through now what their requests are what they what they want to see happen here uh so focus on the effects of shifting veterans uh demographics this is a part that kind of is like man that's not right but here we go. At least during the next decade, the VA will experience a significant generational shift in its overall patient population. Of the approximately 18 million veterans alive today, roughly 9.1 million are enrolled for VA healthcare, and 6.4 million of these enrollees use VA healthcare consistently. These 6.4 million veterans are split almost evenly between those who are over the age of 65 and those who are under the age of 65. They mean all reproductive care as far as miscarriages and so on. So the specifics of that, I just do not know. From what I have heard from military leadership is that it's the whole thing. Like they don't pick apart what's okay and what's not okay. It's it's a healthcare service and they take care of it. So if, if health care is involved because of that, then, you know, it's covered They're Again, they're not splintering it out like a lot of the uh, laws are trying to do. If that makes sense. Surgery trains a surgeon. Yeah, I don't. I know it's. Yeah. All right. But the share of VA's health care dollars is spent predominantly in the over 65 cohort. Uh, that share increases significantly as veterans live, live longer and use the VHA system at a higher rate. VHA enrollment of new users are increasingly at risk of being exceeded by the deaths of current enrollees, primarily because significant numbers of Vietnam generation are reaching their life expectancy. The generational transition from Vietnam-era veterans to post-9-11 veterans will take several years to complete. The ongoing demographic transition is a catalyst for needed assessments on how the VA can improve the delivery of care to a numerically declining and differently dispersed national population. Of veterans, a population that is more active, reaching middle age or retirement age, and migrating for lifestyle and career reasons. The medical pro yeah, I agree, I agree. Um, that's a good question, Regal. That's a great question, if it was or not. I cannot remember either. At the center of the VHS, VHA's evolution during this generational transition is an ongoing tension, some of it politically contrived, between 
direct care for veterans provided from inside the VHA system and community care for veterans who are referred to private providers participating in the VHA's two community care networks. In recent years, the budget for community care has grown as the demand for veterans has risen sharply, sometimes outpacing the budgets for the community care at individual um, VAMCs. The Trump administration made community care part of its veteran-centric approach to ensure the veterans would be able to participate more fully in their health care decisions and have options if or when the VHA was unable to meet their needs. The Biden administration has watered down that effort as has sought various procedural ways to slow the rate of referrals to private doctors and at some facilities is reportedly manipulating the community care access standards required by the VA Mission Act of 2018. If the makeup of Congress is favorable in 2025, again, everyone, they're at least acknowledging here that their requests need to go through Congress, the next administration should rapidly and explicitly codify the VA Mission Act access standards in legislation to prevent the VA from avoiding or watering down the requirements in the future. Uh, this I know, I agree, Jennifer. I feel like it is gross as well. <laughs> it does seem that way. Mm-hmm. There we go. Hold on, everybody. Are you, uh, are we buffering at all? Are you guys okay? Are you frozen? Are you all right? I'm wondering, I had a breakthrough here. Are we okay? We're okay, okay, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm just, you know, the trolls, I'm telling you. Okay, no buffering, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. We're gonna keep going forward then uh, as and moving through this. Okay, great. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, I appreciate that. I was, I was worried. Here we go, so. Uh, First and foremost, a veteran's bill of rights is needed so that the veterans and the VA staff know exactly what benefits veterans are entitled to receive with a clear process for the adjudication of disputes and so that staff ensure that all veterans are informed of their eligibility for community care. Currently, veterans are not routinely and consistently told that they are eligible for community care unless they request information or are given a referral. So I'm not sure uh, if, hold on here, everybody. I'm having to reset my stuff, just a second. So would you, um, would you think that that is true? Mm-hmm. Hold on here, sorry everyone. I'm having a little bit of a problem here. Okay, sorry, I'm back. <laughs> Here we go, back again. Um, okay. We don't know. All right, there we go. Sorry, everybody. Had a quick pause there in a minute. Uh, so then they're going to start uh, taking us through their billet, bullet points of what they want to do again. All right, so uh, to strengthen community care, the next administration should create new secretarial Uh, directives to implement the VA Mission Act properly. Sections for consideration and areas for reform include the following. Number one, section 101 and 103, community care eligibility for access standards in the best medical interest of the veteran. So they're saying they wanna reform these pieces that have already been passed. Section 104, community care access standards and standards for quality of care. Then number three, section 121, developing and administering an education program that teaches veterans about their health care options available from the Department of Veterans Affairs. Four, section 152, returning the Office uh, for Innovation of Care and payment to the Office of Enterprise Integration with a joint governance process set up with the VHA. Community care was approved within a week. Oh, really? Oh, that's good. That's excellent. Yeah, I thought there was quite a bit of a, you know, wait in between. Section 161, overhauling family caregiver program expansion. 
which has gone poorly, so that it focuses on consistency of eligibility and awareness that the most severely wounded or injured may require the program indefinitely. That would be number five. So next, require the VHA to report publicly on all aspects of its operation, including quality, safety, patient experience, timelines, and cost effectiveness using standards similar to those in the Medicare Accountability Care Organization Program so that the government may monitor and achieve continuous improvement in the VA system more effectively. And lastly, encourage VA medical centers to seek out relevant academic and private sector input in their communities to improve the overall patient experience, which I would say people probably are already doing. Limited number of visits, not paid in a timely manner. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we don't, we don't like that. That could, that could be better. All right, so next up we have the budget. Now again, it sounds like the person that wrote this is kind of a numbers guy as opposed to an actual vet maybe. I mean, is he even a vet? <sighs> That's a good question. All right, budget. Uh, conduct an independent audit of the VA similar to the 2018 Department of Defense, which I can't say that word on TikTok. <laughs> audit to identify IT management, financial, contracting, and other deficiencies. Ac uh, assess the misalignment of VHA facilities and rising infrastructure costs. The VHA operates 172 inpatient medical facilities nationally that are an average of 60 years old. I guess that's the average. Uh, some of these facilities are underutilized and inadequately staffed. Facilities in certain urban and rural areas are seeing significant declines in the veteran population and strong competition for fresh fresh medical staff. Is that is that the correct word for for medical staff? What do you mean fresh? Like like fish? What is he talking about? And he is. He's a he's actually qualified. Okay, great, great. Well, at least there's that. At least there's that, everybody. Okay, he's a vet. I'm glad to hear that. I was I was worried, honestly. In 2018, Congress authorized an Asset Infrastructure Review, or an AIR, of National VHA. He was used Marine for 22 years. Really? As opposed to, yeah, I know. Yes, the payment was, okay. So, all right. Well, fair enough, everybody. Fair enough. So we do have a veteran here if he's got 22 years, although I still don't like how he's referring to people. In 2018, <laughs> Congress authorized the AIR of National VHA Medical Markets to provide insight into where the VA healthcare budget should be responsibly allocated to serve veterans more effectively. However, the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee lacked the political will to act on the White House's nominations of commission members and thus ultimately led to the termination of the AIR process. The next administration should seek out agile, creative, and politically acceptable operational solutions to this aging infrastructure status quo. Uh, Reimagine the healthcare footprint in some locales and spur a realignment of capacity through budgetary allocations. Specifically, so we've got two pieces here. Number one, embrace the expansion of community-based outpatient clinics as an avenue to maintain a VA footprint in challenging medical markets without investing further in obsolete and unaffordable VA healthcare campuses. And two, explore the potential to pilot facility sharing partnerships between the VA and strained local healthcare systems to reduce costs by leveraging limited talent and resources. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, that's true. We don't know if he uses the VA. A little jaded to some veterans and treatment. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. Yep. All right, personnel. Next piece. Extend the term of the Undersecretary for Health, USH, to five years. Additionally, authority uh, should be given to reappointment this to reappoint this individual for a second five-year term both to allow the continuity and to protect the USH from political transition. Now, you know, everybody, I, I don't think that this is a bad idea. 
I don't think this is a bad idea. I think any of our positions that we can make uh, go a little bit longer so that they're less political, I'm a fan of. What do, what do we think about that? Am I crazy? But I, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad idea. What, what are we thinking here? I'm, I'm trying to see what people... Here we go. Is this good? Do they want them not to cover... Or also, yeah, that's a good question. That would be great, actually. Okay, okay, yeah, I'm wondering. Again, once you have that five-year requirement, then, you know, you're switching. It follows into the next uh, person that becomes president. I'm with you. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah, I'm wondering. I mean, this this isn't a bad idea. So, you know, let's just uh, acknowledge that where we can here. Establish a senior executive service, so an SES position, a VHA Care System Chief Information Officer, CIO, selected by and reporting to the Chief of the VHS Care System with a dotted line to the VA CIO. I don't even know what that is. I don't know enough about uh, the uh, structure here. Identify a workflow process to bring wait times in compliance with the VA Mission Act required timeframes whenever possible. I think that's always a good idea, too, to set times and deadlines. Uh, I think that would also be good. It's great until you get into a situation like with the post office. Oh, that's good. Having a chief CIO is not a bad idea. Okay, okay. I thought they were cutting. Sp- well, we were, we're going to uh, continue through here. There's still, there's still more. So we're just, we're just getting started. So here's part of that identifying the workflow process. These are the steps that they are proposing. Number one, assess the daily clinical appointment load for physicians and clinical staff and medical facilities where wait times for care are well outside the time frames required by the VA Mission Act. I think that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea, everybody. I think we need uh, to have somebody look into that as well. Uh, require VHA facilities to increase the number of patients seen each day to the equal number seen by the DOD medical facilities, approximately 19 patients per provider per day. Currently, VA facilities may be seeing as few as six patients per provider per day. This one I'm not sure about. I'm not sure about this one uh, because based off of the facility and how many people are there, that's really what says how many people you can take care of. If you just put a blanket number on every single facility, that's going to be, yeah, that was bad. Agree, agree. That's going to take up a lot of time. Uh, and you've got doctors, you know, rushing here. It depends. Many veterans have a sense. True, true. That's a lot of people getting brushed off. <laughs> yeah, I agree. All right. So number two, mm, we don't we don't like number two. Number three. Consider a pilot program to extend weekday appointment hours and offer Saturday appointment options to veterans if a facility continues to demonstrate it has excess capacity and is experiencing delays in the delivery of care for veterans. So, all right, I I think this is a good idea, but on the other hand, I mean, how the people are staffing uh, these facilities, are they getting paid overtime? Are they... Um, getting switched up enough so that they're not working, you know, 18 hour days. I, I would be concerned about the workers here. I mean, I like the idea, but I'm, I'm worried about the staff. Uh, they offer weekend already in Houston. Okay. Okay. So maybe they want to do, yeah, cut the pay to the nurses. and the Exactly. Exactly. Need more time. Right. Older people have more medical issues and need more time. I agree. I agree. It won't happen to me being counters. <laughs> No overtime and less hourly. All right, fair enough. I, I just, I, I worry about this due to, again, the staffing uh, situation. They're way, way underpaid, exactly. And then, you know, it, for me, I think of our teachers where, you know, you think the teacher just goes in from, you know, seven to four. Meanwhile, they're working hours into the evening and on the weekends to do their work, but not getting paid for it. You know what I'm saying? So I worry about that. There's not enough staff as it is. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Your VA doc will spend more time with me. Okay, well, that could be. That could be. It just, uh, hospitals outside, even VA are lacking clinicians. Oh my gosh, of course, of course. I don't know. I'm questioning number three. I'm questioning number three. I like the idea. I'm not sure if it could actually be implemented in a way that's not harmful. Staffing is not the issue. They have rotating schedules for all but the doctors. All right, all right. 
All right. Well, you're already in a place that has that. And so I think you probably would have better knowledge on whether or not this is a good idea. So can't get good employees across the board because of, of bad pay. True, true. All right. Well, this, I think, is going to come down to the money in my in my humble opinion and how we're treating uh, staff. But so this one's a maybe. Number three is a maybe. Number four, identify clinical services that are consistently in high demand but require cost prohibitive compensation to recruit and retain talent and examine exceptions for higher competitive pay. Um, I don't know. I they're talking about recruiting and retaining talent, but you know, they're not filling the positions already. Less experience, so you can pay less. Yikes. Ooh, we don't like that. Mm. I'm not sure. What are what are we thinking about number four? It's money. Always not enough money. They want retired doctors to work for free. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm not surprised. All right, we'll put a question by that one too. I haven't crunched the numbers, so when in doubt, put a question mark. <laughs> Indeed. So here's number five. Assess the medical facilities where community care is readily available, but referrals for community care are below the averages in other similar markets. Referrals expiring are above average and or canceled appointments are above the average. Identify reasons and factors and consider possible ways to improve timeliness and responsiveness for veterans. So this is one where the only goal here is to research and gather information. And I'm always a big fan of that. So it's not requiring anything to be done. They're trying to look into a problem. So I'm okay with that. I think number five is good. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm definitely okay with number five. So next, further explore how the leverage telehealth how to leverage telehealth to reduce personal costs across the enterprise and serve veterans. Continue to pursue expansion of broadband services to remote and rural areas. Oh, I like that one too, everybody. I like that one too. This is a, I think this is a good one. What do we think? Number six. Number six, I think is good. Telehealth is a bad idea. Really? You know, I'm wondering, uh, because again, they said half of the vets are over 65 and then half are under. So, you know, if you're over 65, is that going to be a factor? Is that a factor? Okay. It's great for mental health. Oh, that's good. Okay. Okay. You use it. Uh, yeah, I was going to, I wonder about that. I think, um, you know, I think the option of having it is good. And then also, you use telehealth. Okay, okay. Well, you're spring chicken still. That's why. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Telehealth. Okay. Okay, misdiagnosis is due to not physically seeing. Ooh, that's a good point, too. That's a good point. Mm, yeah, I think I see good and bad. I see good and bad. Husband likes the telehealth satellite clinic. In her. Okay, okay. So I would say... Um, you know, overall, okay, but uh, we need to watch out for misdiagnoses. I don't know how to spell that. Uh, misdiagnoses. And also, uh, rather than a requirement, make it an option, I think would be okay as well. <clears throat> Older people have difficulty with technology. Well, you know, we all do. <laughs> Everybody does when you try to go into something and it's so frustrating. But when with that, though, I think any kind of expansion of broadband broadband services, that's a good a good piece. I think that is always good. Optional. Yes. Physical health is usually in person. Excellent. Excellent. They need to see a doc in person before telehealth. Good point, Thomas. Good point, because you have to have that established. I don't know. You know, it's a big it's a huge debate, even in the educational field, everybody, where they're saying in person classes uh, cannot be truly replaced by online learning because you have so many things that you do one-on-one -on -one or back and forth between yourself and the students, and particularly like science labs and those kinds of things. You just can't quite recreate that classroom experience uh, when you're doing online learning. Meaning for me, how I think of this is, although uh, it's a telehealth situation, you still don't have that full range of what you would have if you had an in-person uh, appointment. But on the other hand, that may be the only way that works for that person. 
Yeah, yeah. So I see both ways. I see both ways. Mm -hmm. Continuing care, not new diagnosis. So I think, too, uh, something to add would be, um, uh, you know, it, it would have to seem like which kind of cases are best, uh, best suited or lend themselves best uh, to telehealth. Right, right. Have to see us. Well, yeah, right, right. In person, right. And it seems like most people do that. Um, they'll do telehealth, but then you have to come in at least once a year and see them in person. Not urgent. Right. I think that's a great way to put it, uh, Gray Street, for mental health and non-urgent, non-diagnostic. I think that's that's really great. For vets, we have to drive far to the be. Yes, exactly. And that's a huge issue. Homebound can be good for telehealth. That's also true. That's also true for people who are homebound and are unable to actually leave, right? Because transportation can be a nightmare uh, when you are unable to uh, move around. But it sounds like they want to mirror what TRICARE is already doing. Right. And, you know, we're not we're not defending or supporting or against anything. I think it's important to just look and see, you know, what do you got? What do you got? What are you talking about? You know, some of this sounds OK. Some of this doesn't sound OK. You know, like we're thinking, woo, telehealth is great. Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, if we go back <laughs> to the beginning of the chapter, we're like, uh continuing the grotesque culture of violence against the child in the womb. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, <laughs> like telehealth or, you know, so there, there's, you know, there's good and bad here. <laughs> there's good and bad. And I think that's okay to talk about. I think that that's all right. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. Make your teeth. Oh, I get it. I get it. All right. Well, this, I think that's an interesting question. I think that's, an, will be an interesting debate to see how that goes forward. All right. Next up. Seven, assess recruitment and retention in highly competitive medical markets to identify common limiting factors for attracting high demand specialized occupations. So this to me looks like it's a, a job hiring question uh, in, in this situation. Shouldn't be a surprise. True, true. Uh, consider aggressively recruiting retired physicians who desire to serve veterans. Hey, we're right there. Who made that comment? where they said they were wanting to hire uh, retired doctors for free. Who made that comment? That was a good call. <laughs> you're ahead. You're ahead of us here in the script. Yikes. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I think that that uh, can, oh, you upgrade. Oh, there you go. You were there. You already had it in your head. <laughs> that's a good question. I, I mean, again, we don't want, if you want to volunteer, then that's fabulous. We all, you know, love that. But on the other hand, if you're in a situation where your services are being, you know, exploited, that's a different kind of case. I'm not sure. Yeah, retired doctors aren't going to work for free. I can't imagine that they would. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's a great question. Uh, consider, I, I don't know. We're going to do, we're going to leave this one. This is going to be called the upgrade uh, number, number eight here. <laughs> Consider expanding VA tuition assistance in exchange for reciprocal service in rural or understaffed VAMCs. Oh my gosh. So this is pretty, this is like what uh, lots of places do, right? Like if you go uh, to school and you learn, uh, they'll pay your tuition and then you come back and serve in a particular area. I mean, that's that's common, isn't it? In In a lot of different kinds of fields. Yeah, arresting them. Ah, oh my goodness gracious. Yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea either. I'm yeah, I would say there's there's some uh good in that as well. As we take a look at it, we'll have to see of course how it all comes down. Going to reduce best practices, people will suffer, possibly. They used to do this. They tried to cancel school cost reduction. Yeah, that's a good point too, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I mean, if it can be done in a way that is um, uh, better, right, definitely common in the medical field. Right, right. That's what certain federal grants do, too. Right, right. I'm, and I know even in the legal field that there can be some kind of, um, well, in the uh, criminal law fields, too, there can be some reciprocal going on. They do some, but not across the board. Okay. Many nurses used to get sign-in bonuses. Some quite, really? Oh, we love that. We love that. You know, it should be the standard rather than the 
bonus or the benefit in my opinion, but that's just my personal opinion. Eliminate educational grants. Well, that seems like that wouldn't work <laughs> with the goal they have here, right? So, you know, I think they aren't all on the same page. All right, number 10, examine the surpluses or deficits in mental health professionals throughout the enterprise, recognizing that the department needs a blend of social workers, therapists, psychologists, and and psychiatrists with a focus on attracting high quality talent. So of course, I mean, this is of course a given. This should just be, uh, you know, this should be the standard. Of course they should do that. It's not something extra. How do they determine quality? Good question. That's contradicting each other's ideas. I agree, VC. I agree. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Veterans like veterans, doctors. Right, right. I agree. I agree. And again, I think this should just be standard, not something that's like, well, let's try this. Like, why aren't you doing that already? (laughs) You should be doing that right now. And uh, for, okay, for being attached to, oh, that's, yeah, we love that. We love that. All right, next, conduct a high priority. Again, we're out of the points here. We're at the very end of the summation of, again, if we can remember which chapter we're on. Hold on, 46, 45, 46. Hold on, here we go, here we go. This is personnel. So they're going through what they want to do to change personnel here. All right, so the concluding paragraph, conduct a high priority assessment of electronic health records. So... EHR, transition delays and functionality problems, VA innovation in healthcare for the next 20 years and beyond will rest squarely on the timely implementation of the new VHS EHR in coordination with the DOD's parallel pacing effort. The VA's EHR rollout has been blocked by technical delays at local facilities where personnel have raised safety concerns and infrastructure has not been modernized to accept the new system. Well, modernize it then, right? Because, sure, (laughs) track talent. We can pay, right, right. I mean, that's a true story too. So, all right, so there's their closing piece. So Veterans Benefits Administration, let's go ahead and uh, I'll kind of uh, go a little bit faster through this next piece. Although I think, again, if we see something that looks okay, I think it's good to talk about it. There's no clue how to write legislation to cover that. True. That is so true. Something about that administration having access to HIPAA is, oh my gosh, absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, you know, HIPAA is there for a reason. Veterans Benefits Administration, so the VBA, needed reforms. The most evident and ongoing concern is the complexity of benefits, which can lead to confusion for the veteran and, if not mitigated early in the veterans' interactions, long-term distrust of an animosity towards the pre- uh, VA, <laughs> towards the VA. Wholesale benefits reform is unnecessary. All right, everybody, that's a big one. Wholesale benefit reforms, not necessary. And politically, a third rail. But effective managerial approaches and technology tools that the current, that currently exist in the private sector could be employed to improve existing VBA activities. All right, so that's good. This problem is most pronounced in the disability claims process, which needs more and better management attention focused on streamlining the procedures involved in processing claims and and administering benefits. The VA must improve timelines and claim uh, adjudication and benefits delivery. Veterans want the VBA to provide timely responses to requests for benefit support. Render uh, empathetic customer service, so have some empathy people and understandable explanations of those benefits and deliver those benefits without frustrating delays. So to me, I think this is just a a statement of like what should be done, but like how do we make it happen, right? Seems to have gotten easier to use. That's good. Private sector doesn't have a smooth process. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I think that's really important to point that out actually. (laughs) goodness sounds like it was written by vet well you know i'm again this seems this language sounds good let's go through and identify uh how they're going to implement it because that's the other thing you can have great dreams but if there's no implementation then you know uh number one identify performance targets for benefits oh 
performance targets. Oh, wait. Report publicly on actual performance each quarter and use these metrics to drive consistent improvement. Mm, I'm not sure about that one. Develop a new Pilot Express 30 commitment for veterans' first fully developed disability compensation claim and organize the VBA to complete the claim in 30 days. And organize the VBA. I think this is a great goal, but I don't know how you would do it. I don't know how that would even be possible. Yeah. Yeah, again, I, I don't know how, how it would even be possible. Hire more private companies to perform disability and medical examinations. Delays in completing the examinations could be eliminated with more external capacity. I mean, again, I don't know how, uh, how you do that. I mean, you need more people. Uh, increase automation. Hiring additional staff to process claims is costly and is inflexible and has yielded mixed results. Attempting to change laws and regulations simply to adjudicate claims would be a Herculean effort, right? Uh, given their complexity, the best way to provide benefits faster and more accurately is by using technology to perform most of the work. So are we in the AI land here? Are we going to to A to AI? I'm I don't know. I'm are we is this Hal? Is Hal taking over? Technology uh here currently exists in the private sector, but the VBA lacks the expertise to use it. This would be more of an organizational challenge than a technology hurdle. I don't know about that either. Yeah. I don't know about that one. Um, they're talking about AI. Mm, I'm not sure about the AI. I'm not sold on AI. <laughs> I'm not sold on AI, everybody. It's my own personal bias. <laughs> you need an article. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't know. Well, sketchy, sketchy. All right. Reduce improper payment and fraud. About $500 million is improperly paid out each year. Better tools, training, and management could reduce this substantially, but the rule changes at the department level would be needed. So they're saying, you know, tighten up... Uh, losses so somehow uh money is getting paid out incorrectly so they need to kind of tighten up how they're doing it i think that's just what you should be doing i don't know that yeah i don't i don't know that that's something that would be in a manifesto but all right here we go budget moving on the va schedule for rating disabilities or va srd has assigned disability ratings to a growing number of health conditions over time some are tenuously related or wholly unrelated to military service so oh, this is starting to get a little hinky the further growth in presumptive service connected medical conditions uh, pursued by congress and the veterans service organization begun with agent orange and most recently for burn pits airborne toxins has led to historic increases in mandatory VBA spending in recent years. The VA has a time-phased plan to reassess the VA, VASRD and its ratings for compensation, but this internal process can be slow and laborious, it requires Office of Management and Budget, so OMB approval, and can become pol politically charged, <laughs> sorry everybody, uh, both in Congress and with the VSOs. Right. This isn't sounding good. This, this piece isn't sounding very good, everybody. The next administration should explore how the VASRD reviews could be accelerated with clearance from OMB to target significant cost savings from revising disability rating awards for future claimants while preserving them fully or partially for existing claimants. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, everybody. <laughs> we got we had our optimistic moment. Now we're moving. <laughs> the VBA's information, a technology top line budget, should be reexamined and reassessed in light of the need to for expanded automation across the enterprise. So does that mean we're replacing humans with robots? Right, right. OMB, good luck with that. <laughs> Traditionally, VHA captures the large majority of VAIT funding. The VBA needs to make a case for larger IT budget with clear re requirements to support that request. I'm not sure about that. All right, personnel. Whew. 
All right, let's jump here. Uh, there's actually only a few more pages left, everybody. This is a relatively short uh, piece of it. Personnel, pursue reforms of the human capital management process and operations within the VBA to build a more blended workforce with more contractors to pro process <laughs> to process claims. This would free federal employees to perform other duties and be involved solely with the final decision to award benefits. This doesn't make sense at all. I don't even understand what you're saying here. That whole sentence is seems in, incorrect. Improve the VBA acquisition workforce. The VBA needs more world-class contractor support. Currently, few of the top companies have contracts with the VBA, and the VBA needs to conduct more outreach to the private sector through senior leader engagement in industry conferences. What? To identify more effective and efficient ways to complete claims, establish a knowledge exchange program with top-tier private sector and companies that do similar work. The VBA is fundamentally a financial services organ. That's what it is? Is that what the VBA is? Oh my goodness. A financial services organization. A significant amount of its work has a private sector analog that could be leveraged to improve service to veterans. What? <laughs> For most of its existence, the VBA has been a, a risk-averse, insular, paper-based, paper-based? What's wrong with being paper-based? <laughs> organization implementing technology only over the past decade. This insularity has led to prominently build it ourselves approach, uh, partly because VBA staff has limited experience or insight into current private sector tools and methods, and partly because the VBA struggles to compete with the VHA for IT funding. Senior executive leadership needs more innovations and trailblazers. Uh, qual qualities that have sometimes been lacking in the VBA senior ranks. Ouch, that's not very nice. <laughs> Recruiting a more relevantly knowledgeable and technologically savvy team, along with robust political control of the VA, uh, could bring about a better solution for the VBA's workflow challenges. I don't know about this one. That's true, but use a computer system. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, next up, human resources and administration, so HRA, needed reforms. Rescind all delegations of authority promulgated by the VA under the prior administration. So, <laughs> so wipe out everything. <laughs> it's just funny how they wrote it. I mean, I'm sure administrations do this all the time. Whenever someone comes in, they're going to take care of whatever was there before it gets cut, but... All right, transfer all career SESs out of PAPAS designated positions on the first day and ensure political control of the VA. No, this is the bad, this is the bad man talk. <laughs> so this is where we have this whole issue in P25 is trying to get rid of uh, people who've been there for a really long time, know how to do their job and replace them with loyalists. <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious. Next, take a close and analytically critical look at where hybrid and remote work is a net positive as a functional necessity and where in-person collabor collaboration and presence will help to instill a strong work ethic in a more cohesive environment for productivity from the office of the secretary across the headquarters enterprise. Doesn't specialize in, yeah, that's weird. That's, I think that's weird. I think that's weird. And I'm not sure political control uh, exactly how far they want to take that either. You can get a job then. <laughs> yes, and tell us how it goes. <laughs> the COVID-19 pandemic spurred a significant shift to hybrid and telework options for large segments of the staff in Washington headquarters, in its uh, satellites, and at some VBA regional offices. The remote work expectation has been amplified and formalized within the Biden administration team at VA to the extent that the current secretary, deputy secretary, and their staffs are not in office as a matter of routine presence, while VA staff in Washington, D.C. have limited in-person meetings, relying more frequently on video conference calls. The short-term and long-term effects of this policy on department are unknown, but generally the policy may be 
undermining cohesiveness and competencies of some of the staff functions and diluting general organizational accountability and responsiveness. So wait, I don't get it. They're like, bring AI in to do stuff that people do, but then they're like, but bring all the people in and don't let them work remotely. Like, I don't know how that works together. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. All right, budget. So expedite the acquisition of a new human resources information technology system, HRIT. So new system. The current system is not user-friendly, has minimal fusion, middleware capacity, and is not conducive to data-driven personnel decisions. Personnel data needs to be organized and managed to its full potential. The HRIT system associated uh, databases and other shadow personnel systems have no shortage of data. The problem comes with effective management of the data. Heeks, uh, broaden pay and benefits in critical VA skill sets beyond medical care occupation to be more competitive with private sector industry, IT acquisition, cyber, and economics. Uh, Economists are some examples of skill sets that are difficult for the VA to recruit, uh, largely because of the limitations of federal pay skills. So, all right, continue to maximize the use of the new VA hiring and pay authorities provided by Congress uh, in the RAISE Act and PACT Act, as well as existing authorities in the student loan forgiveness and the public service loan forgiveness programs. So, uh, they did not read the part about getting rid of all the forgiveness programs, apparently. They didn't go over to the Department of Education. They're not going to have those anymore. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Personnel. Foster a culture. <sighs> all right. I need a drink of tea. Just a minute. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. Right. Hiring system. Oh, I know. I mean, okay. Foster, foster a culture uh, that is mission veteran driven, alert, engaged, and habitually responsive to the veteran and structure an environment that promotes a flexible and agile workplace, but not so agile that you're not in office every day. Let's just make that clear. <laughs> Increase employee satisfaction experience to improve recruitment and retention of VA personnel. So retention, but they don't want the uh, people who've been there forever to have any kind of leadership role. So that doesn't seem right. Uh, go beyond the traditional focus on the extrinsic monetary pay and bonuses and seek creative ways to instill teamwork, loyalty, and pride. We're going to call this the pizza party clause, everybody, right? No, I don't need a bonus. Let's just have pizza on Friday, <laughs> right? Like, come on. <laughs> What are you doing? Here's a here's a pencil with the name of the business on it. Here you go. <laughs> pizza party. Let's not pay you more. We'll just give you free pizza. <laughs> you all know what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, train leaders and managers to promote an energized and productive workplace culture and reward those who do well. Ensure that the senior leaders set the proper example. That's just what you do when you run a business. Focus more attention on hiring veterans and military spouses. The percentage of veterans employed at VA has been declining. Uh, you're going to have to watch out for the EEOC here. Although, you know, maybe it won't be, maybe we won't have an EEOC. <laughs> oh, my goodness gracious. Um, mini golf. <laughs> That's funny. Support the White House Office of Presidential Personnel, so PPO, in identifying a fully vetted roster of candidates to assume all key positions at the VA well ahead of formal nominations. So this is another classic P25 spiel here where they're saying we need to build a database of loyalists. Uh, we don't care how uh, qualified they are. We just need to know if they're loyal. So that goes to that piece. Uh, the VA is the second largest federal agency, yet it is authorized a a woefully small number of PAs and PAS positions uh, when compared to other agencies of lesser size. Congress and the Office of Personnel Management should be engaged on ways to provide authorities for a higher number of non-career PA positions. The White House PPO can be inclined to discount the VA's important, 
importance, but given the political attention that VA can generate for Congress and the media, the PPO should understand the importance of finding talented political appointees to serve at the VA. I don't like this. This seems, I'm, I'm not sure about that paragraph. Yeah, I'm not sure about that paragraph. Yeah, interns. Oh my gosh, Trish, I tell you, the intern situation. Oh, man, interns get such terrible treatment. <laughs> Seriously. All right. Increase the number and utilization of limited term appointment senior executive services. So that's the SES. Someone was asking me about senior executive services. Uh, positions for up to three years to work on special projects to ensure talent refreshment, uh, talent acquisition and flexibility. So again, let me just double check here. Oh, yeah. We've only got one page left, everyone. This is our last page. In case you were wondering, and retired doctors, I know, I know. Ugh. Very true, very true. All right, manage the relationship with organized labor effectively and proactively. Now, this one I think is very interesting because P25 is anti uh, workers' rights, labor rights. So let's see what they have to say. Maybe they will go down a different road here, you know. Why not? Who knows? Ensure that any agenda that includes labor or civil service reform in the VA has a clear direction from the secretarial level. Support from the general counsel alignment with the assistant secretary for human resources and administration and a unified and strong political will to carry it out. Without those elements, labor reforms are very difficult to accomplish. True. Ensure that each senior leader in the process gets buy-in from reform-minded career employees willing to accept and support change. Yikes. Those mid-level and senior level managers exist, but they will need to be identified early and shown trust and confidence. Ew. Oh, I don't like that. Like who, who's going to uh, comply, right? Yeah, this, was, this is a bit upsetting. Who's who's loyal? Who's loyal? We don't care what you do. We just want to know if you're loyal. Yeah, <laughs> yikes. Number three, ensure that the White House communicates the labor reform agenda swiftly. Trump administration executive orders on civil service reform uh, here were issued too late and departments and agencies were not prepared to execute them. Okay. Four, anticipate the inevitable opportunities for legal challenges from organized labor. So get ready to be sued and be prepared for them when to happen and be dragged out, which makes early decisive timing all the more, more important. You betcha they're going to be dragged out. This mean vets would have to pay in like other insurance. It kind of, that's the feeling I'm getting, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, five, ensure the White House is prepared to support a concerted and deliberate effort on implementation to avoid perceptions of a disconnected strategy and dis, uh, disaggregated effort. Remain mindful of which labor contracts end when they end and what the agency's goal for renegotiation are. If not done effectively, contract end dates will be missed or lack notification. It is therefore essential to have a clear strategy with respect to what leadership wants from a new contract. <sighs> do not make the perfect do not make the perfect the enemy of the good in contract negotiations. Trying to end unions, yes. Work in Congress, uh, work with Congress to sunset the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection. Wow. Uh, it was well intentioned when formed, but it's redundant with the activities of supervisors, well as as well as the Equal Employment Opportunity Office, Office of the Inspector General, Office of Special Counsel, and other policies, programs, and procedures for holding employees accountable. This redundancy results in lengthy investigations, gaps in coverage, and an overall ineffective method of employee and supervisor accountability. What? So we're going to get rid of the Office of Accountability and Whistleblower Protection. Yeah, there it is. There's another big one. We had two big ones on this page. Yikes and yikes. So, and then here's our last paragraph, everybody. Uh, consider decoupling HRA and the Office of Security and Preparedness, so OSP, when Congress directed that the 
I'm sorry about this, everyone, just one moment, that the OAWP be established. It did not include authorities for a new assistant secretary position. Consequently, the OSP was combined with the HRA to free a PAS position. The functions of the HRA and the OSP are dissimilar and thus create an organization that's difficult to staff with the talent needed to execute both missions effectively. So they're wanting to pull those two uh, departments apart. Oh, all right, everybody. So that's the last page. And then we've got um, just the citations here in the back. All of the end notes, of which there are seven. There are only seven end notes. Yikes. <laughs> ah. So here's the author's note. Let's take a look at this real quick. It says, the preparation of this chapter was a collective enterprise of individuals involved in the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. All contributors to this chapter are listed at the front of the vol volume, but Darren Selnick, Paul Lawrence, and Christopher Anderson deserve special mention. The author alone assumes responsibility for the content of this chapter. No views expressed herein should be attributed to any other individual. Yikes! <laughs> so, uh, what are we thinking, everyone? I know a lot of people were incredibly and are incredibly worried about their uh, veterans' benefits. Rightfully so, right? I mean, you've got to cut from somewhere if you're going to uh, give benefits otherwhere or in other places or as uh, as they like to say, incentives for, you know, bringing their companies to the United States. So, right, you're scared. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, they're going to cut benefits and caregiver programs. So, you know, it sounds like they're moving things around. It sounds like they, uh, they've got some ideas, but it doesn't sound like they've got specific uh, you know, lines that they're ready to get rid of, but the hiring practice, how many positions there are, it sounds great except for real people. <laughs> I think these people wrote it, no care. Well, right, right. This is a hint where other programs will be handled. Actually, I have to say, honestly, I've been reading, you know, as you do, I've read through quite a bit of this and this chapter is unique. It is a little bit unusual. Uh, because I've not been able to get through any of these other chapters with, um, you know, maybe there's one or two decent points that I'm like, oh, yeah, we can take a look at that. But, um, you know, this one, for some reason, is kind of a little is a little bit different. So I'm not sure that this is uh, really what the and the reason I say that is because I don't know that this is the uh, roadmap for the other places. I think this one took its own road. They're in a shell game of funding and programs. Funding and programs. Exactly right. Exactly right. Uh, right. And social security. Accountability aspect itself. Uh, yes, it really is. It really is. Um, and, you know, again, you have to remember, too, overall, the kind of cuts and hits uh, that uh, the country is going to take in order to, you know, give those incentives to the, you know, people that are okay. <laughs> gotten better afraid it's going to get worse i think what we're going to do is again and i would say this overall for this next uh administration is you've got to hold the line that's the key you can't uh hold the line so they can't push us back but are we going to be going forward no no i don't see that at all so that's kind of the piece here is to just say you know what we've got is what we've got at the moment don't take any more from us and we're certainly not going to see any benefits so that kind of is my overall uh piece of advice uh, for everyone here a sliver of empathy i think that's an excellent way of putting it excellent excellent wonder right right i think they'll try more privatization absolutely they will absolutely and uh with all of the problems that kind of can come with that so with that, everybody, I happen to be doing some filing and I knew I was going to do my sub chat tonight. So I thought we could do a little walk down memory lane, everybody. Look at what I found. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, we're switching gears a little bit so we can have a lighthearted ending here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Worships at the... Pro oh, absolutely. Absolutely, VC. Absolutely accurate. All right. So here we go, everyone. 
Who remembers this from New York? Anybody? <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, memories. Look at that, memories. <laughs> oh my gosh, when they were, do you remember when they were doing the voir dire process and we lost those people? Uh, you know, the first few people and the judge was like, dude, stop it. <laughs> like yelled at the media, right? Do you remember that? I'm a New Yorker. Well, then you remember, you remember this then, don't you? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I found these and I was like, oh my gosh, I got to share them, I got to share them. So, you know, again, we have some testimony here in front of that. It still haunts me. <laughs> oh my God, we were all here together. We were all in Miss Hope Hicks. So, you know, a lot of people have been asking on the New York case, like, why would he possibly dismiss the New York case, right? Because we got a motion to dismiss on the floor. One of the questions that's being raised is Miss Hope Hicks. Hope Hicks's testimony because there's this claim that her testimony included information about official acts that uh, the Supreme Court said, you know, they're not supposed to have. So there's this question now on whether or not her testimony kind of violates that um, immunity requirement. And if it does, is it really, is it harmless? Because it could be. But if it doesn't, then, you know, let's keep moving on. And I remember reading through her testimony and a lot of what she was saying, if not the majority of it, uh, was a before the election. So we've got that. So here we go. Here's some more. Oh, the filter. <laughs> Only trial we'll ever see. Well, <laughs> and then Mr. Davidson. <laughs> I just was like, gosh, these were so fun. Oh, remember everybody? Remember the good times? <laughs> remember this? This was so much fun going through this. <laughs> Being like, what's he even doing? This is his first eight hour day that he's had in his whole life. <laughs> Oh my gosh, no, I'm not trying to be rude about it, but you know, facts are facts. <laughs> Wish this case complete. I know, I know. We've, we've got a little bit more work to do because we have unanswered questions uh, regarding how far uh, things are going to go. And ultimately, I think the U.S. Supreme Court is going to have to come back and say, you know, Hope Hicks's testimony wasn't within the confines or it you know, it was, but it's a harmless error. And we've definitely got, uh, with Justice Kagan on there, she's going to be smacking people around a little bit. So we do have these. Uh, these are the court reporter artists. So this is his secretary here. Everybody remember the secretary. She's like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to testify against you. And I think one of my top three favorites uh, was Mr. Pecker. Does everybody remember Mr. Pecker? <laughs> Mr. Pecker, who uh, was in charge of the National Enquirer, and he was like, this is too far. <laughs> this, this is too far. I'm not going to pay a <laughs> porn star. You took things too far, even though he's in charge of the National Enquirer. Oh, my goodness gracious. Yes, Mr. Pecker. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He, he's just got black, like, shark eyes. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious, everybody. The memories, the memories, right? <laughs> Too far even for him, right? This is a National Enquirer. Like, there are aliens uh, from Mars coming in, you know, having love children with various celebrities. But it was too far. <laughs> Mr. Trump was too far for the National Enquirer. I still just find that hilarious. Oh, my goodness. And then here we go, everyone. National hero, Miss Stormy Daniels. We love her. We absolutely love her. Right, Miss Stormy Daniels. Oh my gosh, the strength of this woman. <laughs> Sign them and give them out with a date. <laughs> well, I do. I did date, uh, did date them and uh, say which day they were in trial and so on. But um, I just thought it would be fun to... Stormy, I know, right? I mean, she's a great American hero, in my opinion. Truly, truly. She's a leader. Uh, so here we go. Then we've got Madeline Westerhout. So this, again, you know, we start getting into these questions about the White House. It could be that that somehow steps into that immunity decision. I'm not sure exactly how it would be, but... Uh, as an, an award them to subscribers. Oh, my gosh. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do that. Uh, here she is again, uh, and then we have, uh, this is a legal, I think a paralegal or a law clerk that was out of the state's office, and then we have uh, 
Oh, here we go. Here's the next one. Oh, look at him there. Do we see? <laughs> here we go. You know, is everyone still watching uh, what's going on with these? I know, the walk down memory lane, right? Memories. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And they had to, like, uh, white out or fudge out the uh, jurors to make sure that there was some safety. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Colin, he's still there. He's still He's still doing the TikTok lives, man. He's out there. He's working hard. Oh, my gosh. This is definitely one of my favorites. I may have to put that up in my kitchen. Oh, my gosh. Everybody, do you remember? Oh, my goodness gracious. Do you remember when uh, they were talking about <laughs> the names that Cohen was calling him? <laughs> and he's like, those names are bad. <laughs> and there was this... Oh my gosh, there was this meme that was put up and we, I mean, it took us a couple days <laughs> to figure out what it was. <laughs> oh my goodness, great, super victim. Yeah, <laughs> super victim. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> oh my gosh, I think the artist really captured that moment. Me and Slacking shit counter. <laughs> hey, no problem, Navy Vet, no problem. We're all just, you know, Trying to figure out what's happening here. Now, here are three of the amazing uh, sketch artists. We have uh, Jane Rosenberg, Elizabeth Williams, and Christine Cornell. And every day they were hard at work doing their amazing pieces for us. And then, ah, uh, here we go. <laughs> We've got that. I love that little side eye, like, what's going on? <laughs> can't believe it. I know the artists are amazing. Very talented. Extremely talented. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious, everybody. <laughs> Look at his attorneys. They're like, yay, this is great. Woohoo. <laughs> and Josh Rashawn's like, why am I here? This is not what I signed up for. And then, of course, we have to have the Access Hollywood a tape a discussion. <laughs> so there's the picture for that. So... That tribe was awesome. Oh, I'm so, yeah. we were very thorough. <laughs> we were very thorough. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I went through all of those transcripts and I've kept them and I keep thinking like, maybe I should read some of those again. <laughs> I never did get all the way through that closing argument. Maybe I will. <laughs> but this trial was just a very, very interesting, very interesting situation. And, uh, you know, we were all in it together all the time, every day. So I feel like, you know, we kind of uh, climbed a mountain. We will see what happens. Again, I don't know what's going to happen with that motion to dismiss, but uh, we shall see. We did the best that we could, everyone.